Well, hello everyone. Um, hope all is well with you uh, this Sabbath day. Um, I recently had a conversation, and perhaps many of you have had uh, these as well, but I had a recent one with a business colleague of mine <clears throat> about, um, about the ongoing impact the uh, novel coronavirus is having um, on society, the, you know, the various decisions that governments have made and are making, the many moving parts, and, and how, it's a, how it affects the populace and their reactions to them. You know, how different people view the virus itself and, and the risks associated with it. You know, how that, how that drives decisions, uh, behaviors, you know, actions, reactions. You know, how they live their life or, <clears throat> or not live their life, or at least how they used to. And frankly, just how distracting all of this can be. You know, and in a way that, could, that can so easily compromise, uh, you know, attention, focus, and engagement on the more important things in life. Now, of course, uh, it is not just affecting us here in the U.S., but it's uh, affecting people globally. And uh, while my business uh, colleague and I, <clears throat> we do differ on our respective understanding of you know, doctrines and teachings in the Bible, uh, we did have some common ground and that we both see, the, both see the real answers to world problems as being found in a relationship with God. And that's where the true answer is. Um, we are also um, in agreement that no matter how <clears throat> this turns out and when, <laughs> uh, we have to make the best of things, um, do the best, uh, do our best uh, with the opportunities and uh, situations we're presented. As life, in that sense, uh, it moves on and it still needs to be lived. Um, in Ecclesiastes uh, chapter 9, Solomon, um, he shares how, how it's good to be alive, uh, while at the same time, advising that the, uh, that the most should be made of it. Um, he conveys uh, through much of the book of Ecclesiastes that on one hand, uh, life is vanity, uh, meaning life can be a rather, rather empty pursuit if we don't choose wisely, if it's, if it's not God-centered, and that life is, well, it's transitory. Uh, life's temporary, life's, uh, life's short, uh, which of course affects every one of us, all of humanity, uh, one way or another. Uh, but on the other hand, he also focuses on how life should not be devoid of hope. And life, for that reason, life provides uh, lots of things, doesn't it? It provides opportunities uh, for development. It provides opportunities for change. And in that way, we can have a, a life of significance, um, including the hope um, that we have of eternal life at God's uh, appointed future time, the coming, coming kingdom of God, and, and how we should make good with our preparation for it. And of course, the opportunity now of living a life, a good life, you know, to the glory of God, you know, regardless of the circumstances we might see or face, uh, including coronavirus, or uh, for that matter, the, the civil unrest that is so much a part of the news as of late. Well, in the first section of that Ecclesiastes chapter 9, Solomon then draws a conclusion. <clears throat> as we read in Ecclesiastes 9 verse 10, I'll refer to it here. Where he says, whatever your hand finds to do, do it with your might. For there is no work or device or knowledge or wisdom in the grave where you are going. You know, there's a time when each of us can do things. And a time when, well, that will no longer be the case. And with the time, though, that we are given, there is wisdom in diligently making the best of it. I'm sure we all appreciate the sense of urgency uh, on this, as Jesus um, shared a similar concept. And, and conclusion, as we, as we read in John chapter 9, verse 4, John 9, 4. Uh, again, uh, John 9, 4 reads, I must work, I must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. The night is coming when no one can work. So for the, for the sermon time today, the split sermon, let's, let's consider something that can occupy a considerable amount of our time. And something that we set our hands to do, whether literally or figuratively. And in general terms, let's focus on work. Work, which as we'll be reminded today, is a, is a pretty broad concept in the Bible. And we'll, we'll approach this in a way that answers the question, does God have expectations with regards to our work? Does God have expectations with regards to our work? And as we'll be reminded, the the principles that we'll talk about and review today apply to just about any worthwhile thing we do with our time and the quality of it. So uh, with that, the sermon title today is simply Excellent Work. Uh, excellent Work for the title. So first, let's, well, let's talk a bit about work. Again, 
in, in general terms. If we, um, for example, um, think about it in, in relation to employment, according to the U.S. Department of Labor, um, in 2018, which is the most recent published annual um, statistics that I could find on this, the average workday for employed people is 8.3 hours. So uh, what do they do with the rest of the 24-hour day? Uh, that is on average. Well, besides 8.3 hours of work, they do 8.7 for sleeping and personal care, 3.2 for leisure and sports, 1.1 for eating and drinking, one hour for household activities, a half an hour for caring for others, half hour for shopping, and 0.7 hours for everything else, including a whopping nine minutes, nine minutes for organizational, civic, and religious activities combined. Yeah, that's it, nine minutes a day on average for people who are otherwise employed. Of course, many of us may not have or no longer have a career, a profession, an occupation, what have you, uh, for many reasons, you know, including retirement. Or maybe you're younger and uh, early in the process of developing your career, profession, or occupation, in which case uh, perhaps you do a different kind of work, like homework, you know, schoolwork. Or as many of us have to consider, particularly in the spring and summer months, yard work. And there's always housework to be done. And there are many forms of working out, you know, engaging in physical uh, exercise, uh, as it can have an effect on health, quality of life, and longevity. Um, even Bible studies can be a form of exercising the mind, you know, a form of schoolwork. You know, referring back to John 9, verse 4, uh, where Jesus said, I must work the works of him who sent me while it is day, the night is coming when no one can work, uh, reminds us of the commission of the church, you know, to preach the gospel to all nations, to all peoples, which we commonly refer to as what? We call it the work, the work. <laughs> and we all play a part in that too. You know, God instructs us to work. Even the Sabbath command in Exodus uh, chapter 20 speaks of this. Uh, Exodus 20 verse 9, um, six days you shall labor and do all your work. Then rest on the seventh day. Now the word work here is, uh, is the word melakha. Uh, melakha, it's uh, M-E-L-A-K-A-H, melakha. And it means occupation and manner of workmanship occupation and manner of workmanship. So developing um, also, uh, developing those skills or learning work skills and all those kinds of things is also, you know, part of preparing to live on our own or, or to start a family. Um, Proverbs 24, verse 27, Proverbs 24, 27 reads, it says, prepare, prepare your outside work, prepare your melaka, make it fit. And here's another interesting word. It's called a thought, a t h a d, a thought. It says, "Make it fit." It means prepare, make it ready for yourself in the field, and afterward build your house. You know, skill and um, preparation. You know, an occupation, whatever that chosen field or skill may be, are part of becoming independent. And this verse is commonly referred to um, in marriage counseling, as the idea also brings with it the condition that. You know, financial security is part of premarital planning you know, before starting a family. You know, how one chooses to work and acquire those skills is part of that. It's part of planning for that. Um, let's turn to Genesis chapter 1. Genesis 1. Work <clears throat> is part of life. And God set an example and, and standard you know, from the beginning. Let's, uh, let's pick it up in verse 31 of Genesis 1, the uh, last verse of the chapter. <clears throat> as we uh, read part of the creation accounts uh, found here. Genesis uh, 1, 31, and we'll read through verse 2, verse 3. Then God saw everything that he had made, and indeed it was very good. Very good. Good. Good is a word called tob, T-O-W-B, tob. And uh, it means beautiful. It means fine. It means pleasant. It means well-favored. Excellent. So, God saw everything he made, and indeed it was very good. So the evening and the morning were the sixth day. Thus the heavens and the earth, and all the hosts of them were finished. And on the seventh day, God ended his work, his melaka, which he had done. And he rested on the seventh day from all his work, which he had done. Then God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it, because in it he rested from all his work, 
which God had created and made. You know, work. Um, work can be specific, as it's shown here. The work God did with creation, uh, what was made. Work can be a profession, uh, an occupation, while at the same time it's very much framed in terms of the manner of workmanship. That means the quality, the excellence of what is done. Not only what the worker does, but how good it is. In other scriptures, work is described in more broad terms. Um, that include uh, those things which we set our minds to do or set our hands to do, our actions in general. Um, work should be part of our life in whatever form that may take and engaged in such a way that, well, we do the best work we can. With that in mind, let's, let's turn to Proverbs chapter 22. Proverbs 22. I'm going to ask, uh, ask some questions here. Um, that is, if we're going to follow God's example, should our, should our work demonstrate a quality um, and, and excellence that, that's reflective of his principles, uh, his wisdom, you know, his teachings, his way of doing things? Is that, is that something God should see in what we do? Or put another way, does the quality or excellence of what we do matter? Does it matter? Proverbs 22, let's read verse 29. Proverbs 22, 29. And it says, do you see a man who excels in his work? He will stand before kings. He will not stand before unknown men. You know, interestingly, Solomon addresses this in the form of a question uh, for each of us to answer. And that is whether we have seen, have we noticed, have we observed someone with excellent work skills? Now, I would imagine that each of us could think of many examples of excellent work we've seen. And this is, this is not intended to be, <clears throat> to be limited to those who are of a paid profession. Do you see a man who excels? Do you see someone who excels? Excels in this verse has the, has the primary meaning of being diligent and at the ready. Now, could someone literally stand before kings or people of renown because of their skills? Well, well sure. Yet, this is also framing a much larger question. <clears throat> is God directing our work, our manner of workmanship, uh, the quality and excellence of worthwhile pursuits, such that we are diligent and prepared to stand before our King, such that ultimately when we do, will he say, well done, good and faithful servant. You know, God's Word, of course, is such a wonderful and incredible thing. It, it joins together all these beautiful spiritual principles, physical applications like this, and as we are asked to take notice of excellence and understand what drives it, including diligence and being at the ready, and in turn that we reflect those qualities as well in our work, in our endeavors. Now let's go ahead and take this diligence uh, concept and thread a little bit further, turning to Proverbs chapter 6. Proverbs chapter 6, we'll look at another example <clears throat> that um, illustrates the importance of diligence and work and other worthwhile pursuits. Uh, we find in this proverb a wonderful example from God's creation that is of itself very small. It's a proverb that involves the ant, the little ant. As Solomon helps us uh, capture a word picture with the lesson of something we can see uh, with our own eyes or, or visualize in our mind. Proverbs 6, 6 through 11. It says, go to the ant, you sluggard. Go to the ant, you sluggard. Now this word sluggard, I just want to point out that it's a, it's a word called atzel. It's A-T-S-E-L, atzel. But it means indolent. So what we want to picture here when they say sluggard, because we don't always necessarily use that term today. Um, indolent is, uh, again, picture someone having, or someone wanting to avoid activity. Somebody wanting to avoid exer exertion, you know, think, think lazy, think slothful, uh, think unmotivated, okay? So go to the ant, you sluggard, consider her ways and be wise, which having no captain, overseer, or ruler, provides her supplies in the summer and gathers her food in the harvest. How long will you slumber, O oh sluggard? When will you rise from your sleep? A little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands to sleep, you know, so shall your poverty come on you like a prowler and your need like an armed man. You know, uh, keeping, you know, this example of the ant now in mind, let's jump over a few pages 
um, as we also refer to a similar account found in uh, Proverbs chapter 24. Proverbs 24, uh, where we can form yet another word picture. Uh, Proverbs 24, uh, we'll, we'll read verses 30 through 34. Um, I went by the field of a lazy man, and by the vineyard of the man devoid of understanding. And there it was, all overgrown with thorns. Its surface was covered with nettles. Its stone wall was broken down. When I saw it, I considered it well. I looked on it and received instruction. And the next two verses repeat the same conclusion we read from Proverbs uh, chapter 6. Let's read 33 and 34 here. A little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands to rest. So shall your poverty come like a prowler, and your need like an armed man. When we think of, of these two examples, but though they're distinct, both um, seek to help us to visualize um, the same lesson, the same teaching. Um, the ant is shown uh, to do the right thing without someone supervising their work, individually and collectively. They just, they just do it. Uh, reminds me of something often shared in the business world where you know, consultants uh, teach organizations uh, about organizational qualities and people qualities that are needed for success. Um, and there's a saying that that's, that's commonly used, and that is that integrity, integrity is doing the right thing even when no one is watching. Integrity is doing the right thing even, though, even when no one's watching. And these ants, um, they do that, the right thing, even if nobody's looking, so to speak. And they know when they're supposed to do it. You know, metaphorically, the ant is, is faithful in the little things. The, ant, the ant's diligence is diligent, excuse me. And the ant is at the ready. And so the ant excels at work. Um, and the sum of that integrity, consistency, the sum of their many decisions, um, or instinct as the case may be, work to their success. You know, in this sense, the ant does not deviate, you know, to the left or to the right. The ant does not compromise. The, you know, the lazy person, though, is described as much different. And their example, their action, um, or actually their inaction, um, is a better way to put it, leads to poverty. The, the very opposite of success. Notice also <clears throat> the example of the lazy man's vineyard, that it doesn't all necessarily happen overnight. It takes time for a field to be overgrown. It takes time for a field to be taken over. It takes time for stone walls to break down. But it starts somewhere, in this case, with a little bit of laziness. Metaphorically, it can start when someone's not faithful in the little things or big things. <laughs> as the case may be. And the, and the sum of those, though, some of those many decisions to not engage the work that's needed, a lack of you know, integrity and diligence in work, will suddenly bring poverty at some point, and unexpectedly. Of course, this isn't just about physical poverty, is it? So again, these, these analogies, they, they extend to our physical life, our spiritual life, and, and whether we'll have success in either of them. Um, just to further illustrate the point here and, and the cause and effect nature of this, I'll refer to a couple of additional scriptures here. Uh, one being Proverbs 18, verse 9. He who is slothful in his work is a brother to him who is a great destroyer. Um, this too describes the relationship between laziness and destruction, uh, or poverty, um, as the case may be. Um, we also read in 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 10, that for even when we were with you, we commanded you this, if anyone will not work, neither shall he eat. So work is, work is in its various forms, is, it's, it's an important thing. And the kind of work, the quality of it, and the diligence and the integrity behind it, and what we apply to it, is also very, very, very important. I'm not gonna ask for a show of hands, not that I could anyway, but have you ever had uh, tendency to procrastinate. You know, I'm asking this, I'm, <clears throat> I'm talking here in general terms about putting off something that is important to do and done right that should be done now or earlier than later. I'll ask uh, another uh, question too here. Have you ever, have you ever tried to engage the, the strategy of a, well, of a shortcut when you knew it wasn't really the right thing to do or, you know, the appropriate way to do it? 
you know, both of these questions speak to the integrity um, and quality of what we do and, and whether we have diligence. Um, I'll just share a personal story with you. Perhaps many of you have heard it before. I remember as a young teenager uh, working on a job site with my father and given a very specific task to do with a, with a simple ob objective. And, and the goal was straightforward. I mean, even though the work was hard, um, I was. Um, I was to dig, I think it was about a 60 foot long ditch, um, such that the electrical conduit that was to be buried in it was, if memory serves, about 30 inches deep. You know, pretty basic goal. So armed with a pick and a shovel, you know, I went at it. Now, a wise person would have, you know, for example, first uh, measured from the bottom of the shovel up the shaft and perhaps put a piece of tape on it or did something so that you could easily monitor the depth of the ditch as you progressed. Um, suffice it to say, I, <laughs> I estimated <laughs> the depth as I went. And my estimates, uh, uh, well, they ended up erring on digging a shallower ditch. You know, imagine that. You know, sort of the concept. If you don't know the standard by which you're measured, you're never going to make the standard, are you? <laughs> so later, I placed the conduit in the ditch, backfilled a couple little portions to hold it in place. Um, but guess what? Tape measures do not lie. Upon inspection by my dad, the, the ditch was found to, to not be deep enough in all places. And so he responded with one of those catchphrases, you know, never enough time to do it right, always enough time to do it over. <laughs> you know, and the lesson is this, you know, details matter, diligence, it matters, integrity, quality matters. And if we're going to do the job right, um, I mean, if you want to be successful, that is, we've got to be able to tame the standard that's asked in work and in all worthwhile pursuits and endeavors. You know, um, of course, shortcuts <clears throat> and subpar work are not found in any scripture in God's word as God's strategy or direction for us or some kind of example that he set. And in this case, I obviously failed the ant test. I knew what to do. I was given all the tools needed to do it. And I should have been able to do it without supervision. It's easy enough. You know, God blesses those who are, though, diligent, those who do it his way. And perhaps it should go without saying, but <clears throat> excuse me, it is always best to do whatever work or job or activity we engage in, you know, in the right way the first time and at the right time, as opposed to anything less. You know, success or poverty, again, the lesson here is both physical and spiritual. Does God have expectations with regards to our work? Yes. Yes, he does. Many other scriptures in the Bible also show us specific ways we are to do things to give us, you know, specific or give us specific um, directions um, for success. Uh, for example, we can find help and guidance by uh, asking others. In uh, Proverbs 11, verse 4, we read that in the multitude of counselors, there is safety. But even if we get counsel from others, we never, we never want to exclude God, of course, and as God can and does show us and instruct us in specific things to teach, provide wisdom, guidance, so that the work that we do will actually work, that it can be quality, have quality and excellence. Let's turn to Isaiah chapter 28. Isaiah 28, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, and as we turn there, I'll just ask a few questions here. Have you, have you ever wondered how people first understood how to do things? Um, or thinking back in history, when the first farmers were on earth, how did they know? How did they know how to do things or anything? Um, how did they know? Well, let's go ahead and pick it up in verse 24 of Isaiah 28, and we'll read actually verses 24 through 29. And it says, Does the plowman keep plowing all day to sow? Does he keep turning the soil, breaking the clods, uh, when he has leveled its surface, does he not sow the black cumin and scatter the cumin, uh, plant the wheat in rows and the barley in the appointed place and the spelt in its place? For he instructs him in right judgment. His God teaches him. For the black cumin is not thrust with a threshing sledge, nor is a cartwheel rolled over the cumin, but the black cumin is beaten out with a stick and the cumin with a rod. Bread flour must be ground. Therefore, he does not thresh it forever, break it with his cartwheel, or crush it with his horsemen. This also comes from the Lord of hosts, who is wonderful in counsel, 
and excellent in guidance. You know, God's quite capable of teaching us all, you know, what to do, how to do it, how best to do it, um, so that it works, you know, for our success, that excellent work be possible. And we're blessed to have, of course, this wonderful instruction book we have, the Bible, you know, and that with God's Holy Spirit to guide us, to open our minds and to see things that we otherwise couldn't see. We have, we have access to this. We have access to all of these wisdom and tools um, that we need for our development and success in life, spiritually and physically. You know, the example from agriculture that we just read, you know, it's also about, it's also about growth. You know, it's about in, you know, increase. And if we want to know how to grow in a particular spiritual area, you know, such as the fruit of the Spirit, we can, we can ask God, seek His counsel, study His Word. Um, if we don't want to backslide, we can ask God for help, direction, resilience, defense. Um, if we fail, if we've fallen short in some way, you know, we, we can ask God for forgiveness and for Him to renew and, and create again in us a clean heart. And, and, and as we just read, God is He's wonderful in counsel and excellent in guidance. I would imagine that each of us have had you know, experiences in some form of struggle with a problem and the solution to that problem at some point in our life. Uh, there has been and will be times when the solution may seem to elude us somewhat or for a period of time when the solution seems beyond our understanding in some way, but, but we always have a path to getting understanding. We know that through prayer, you know, as we search God's word too, as we ask you know, for his will, we implore God to search out our hearts. We ask him to forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. You know, when we're humble, repentant, pliant, a heart that trusts in God and in his knowledge, that he, that he also is the one that can lead us what to do, then, then we're teachable. And he's faithful in giving instruction and provides, and provides, provides understanding of the way we must go. Let's return to the book of Proverbs and turn to chapter 3. And we'll pick it up in verse 5, where God directs our focus, our attention on the source of true understanding and the promise of directing us on a, on a path of success, of excellence, if we follow his lead. And as we read this, we are reminded of a rather humbling truth, and that is we simply are, we simply are not smart enough to, to stay out of the fray if we try to do this. Uh, with our own solutions unchecked. It's always important, so important that we look to God for this. Proverbs 3, 5 through 8. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not in your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him and he shall direct your paths. Do not be wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and depart from evil. It will be health to your flesh and strength to your bones. I'd like for us to focus a bit on verse 6. It says that in all your ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct your paths. And when reading this, I'm reminded of a particular story, uh, one involving uh, Richard Edel, a man I suspect many of you knew uh, very well. Um, it's a story that for me it just helps illustrate this point. And hopefully a memory serves and I can keep all the, all the facts straight here. But, but many years ago, Mr. Edel was the chief scientist at Seattle Silicon. Um, Seattle Silicon was a company that basically created uh, software tools used to design computer chips. And I had the opportunity to do a short internship there, uh, working for free to gain some, some work experience during the, during the summer before I graduated from the University of Washington. Now, while there, I had um, several opportunities uh, to stop by his office uh, for lunch, you know, talk to him, learn more about the company, that sort of thing. Um, and if you were to have sat in front of his desk, you would have noticed that Behind him, behind him on the wall, above the credenza, was some really interesting artwork. It was actually a layout of an engineering drawing of a computer chip, all nicely framed on the wall. And being there and seeing it, I, I became curious, so I started asking questions, but he, but he wouldn't engage me at first and seemed reluctant to tell me much about it. Um, but a couple days later, I brought it up again, and he finally filled me in on some of the details. And you've all heard of silicon chips. I assume you've all heard of uh, silicon chips and computers. Uh, but uh, as, as it turns out, this particular artwork uh, was a snapshot of a chip design um, that used a particular semiconductor material called gallium arsenide. Um, and Mr. Edel had received 
um, an award for the design of this chip. It's all very cutting edge stuff, which by the way, was the fastest computer chip ever built in the world at that time. And I remember sitting there just sort of, you know, my mouth kind of part way open, just trying to comprehend what this all meant. Um, how did he do it? When I, you know, when I finally asked him, he, he just smiled in the way that he does or did um, and said, God is my partner. I needed help. I, I needed help every step of the way. I asked God for that and he, and he showed me how to do it. He showed me how to do it. You know, God can help those who ask him, those who would acknowledge him, who, those who ask for wisdom, seek wisdom, those who seek him, you know, pursue him, those who follow him, keep his commands, trust in him. And he's quite capable of helping all of us in any worthwhile pursuit we might have. In all our ways, we should acknowledge him and he will direct our paths. We'll direct our many decisions. He will guide us to success and excellence because there's no better guide in life, no one better than God to walk with us from the start. You know, these verses, they just, they just remind me too that it's just all too easy to treat God as a, as a fallback position. You know, look to, you know, either after the wrong choice was made or after an unsuccessful attempt at something, when instead he makes it clear that he can be there from the, from the beginning and, it, and is always willing to, to give what it takes to help us if we do our part too. Well, with this in mind, let's, uh, let's turn to Ecclesiastes chapter 10. Ecclesiastes 10, as I ask another question, have you, have you ever tried to do something in life, but it, took, it just took way too much effort? And even when you put all the effort you could muster into it, it didn't quite turn out right. Well, Ecclesiastes 10, verse 10, let's read this verse. If the ax is dull and, the one does, and one does not sharpen the edge, he must use more strength. But wisdom brings success. The quality or excellence in our work or other worthwhile pursuits does, does require diligence on our part, but it need not be unnecessarily hard or complicated. And if we don't use all the right tools or sharp tools, as in this example, you know, without God's wisdom that, that sharpens the edge, so to speak, we can be about as helpless as someone trying to chop a tree down with a plastic knife. You know, it's just not going to work. While God, on the other hand here, has and remains available to help with wisdom, guidance on any worthwhile pursuit we have in this life, such that success can be a reality. You know, Acts does not necessarily go dull after the first swing, does it? But, but why even take the chance at a course of action that has a risk of being ineffective when such a favorable outcome will come about if wisdom is used and for which God is willing to give so graciously? You know, we, we read in Hebrews 11.6 that without faith it's impossible to please him. Uh, for he who comes to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. And perhaps the diligent look at life as a series of what may seem to be small faith, faithful decisions, small ones though, that, that ultimately add up. And that God allows us to do this a piece at, at a time, day by day, uh, while there's opportunity. An analogy we might consider when the task seems large or a challenge insurmountable is that of, a, of moving a pallet of bricks. Although it depends on the type of brick, a typical pallet will have 500 bricks or so and, and weigh about or weigh over or about 3,000 pounds. So now can anyone lift an entire pallet of bricks at a time and by their, by their own strength and not using a forklift or anything? Well, I don't, I don't think so. But if we move a brick at a time, a pallet of bricks can easily be moved. In this case, it could be moved with 500 diligent decisions and actions. And we wouldn't even necessarily need to break a sweat doing it. And being faithful in the little things is somewhat like this. You know, as mentioned in the introduction, you know, there, there are things in life, you know, coronavirus included, um, civil unrest, all these things that can so easily distract and in a way that can, that can compromise our attention or focus our engagement in the important things in life. But we are to be different. We are to be diligent. We are to be faithful 
uh, steadfast in all things and with and with the knowledge too that there is still much work to be done you know does God have expectations with regards to our work yes um, should it be quality work excellent yes it should and reflect be reflected in all of our worthwhile endeavors and everything we do yes our life should be permeated with God's ways will he work with us absolutely Will he guide us and give us wisdom? Absolutely. We've got to do our part. He's always willing to do his. You know, earlier we referenced Ecclesiastes 9, verse 10. I'll read it again here. Whatever your hand finds to do, do it with your mind. For there is no work or device or, or knowledge or wisdom in the grave where you're going. So God allows us to demonstrate our faithfulness in small ways compared to the success he brings us. You know, until the hope, and the timing of meeting the Lord comes to bear with the kingdom of God when we were given eternal life. It's a, it's a good thing that God provides us opportunities in this life for development, for change, you know, for excellence, <laughs> for quality, and in a way that allows us to, to live a life to his glory, that we may do our part and follow the example of, uh, of Jesus that we read earlier too in uh, John 9 verse 4, I must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. The night is coming when no one can work that we do engage this process of quality and excellence in our work with a sense of urgency and continue to seek God and allow him to help us be diligent in all these things to have excellence in what we do as a reflection of God's example and him living in us.